when we signed Culture Club, um, and they were brought in by Danny Goodwin and Richard Griffiths from the publishing side. Uh, Danny was Richard's A&R guy. And they thought, Danny had found this band, they thought they were great, and we heard some songs we thought it was pretty good. And we didn't quite, you know, then there was the whole George factor, which of course, but um, no one else was interested in them. And I remember we, Tony Gordon, who was the band's manager, was desperate to get a record in. We subsequently discovered the band had hired him on a get us a record in three months or you're out basis. So he would have done a deal with, with you know, anyone just to say, I've got your record in. Um, and we, they, there was a rehearsal that we, that they set up for us all to go down to. And I remember specifically Simon, Jumbo, myself, Danny and Richard, I think maybe Steve Lewis went down and they were playing away and the songs were really good. And I remember, and, and, you know, they were playing away and I was sort of like going like this, moving my head around thinking, yeah, it's kind of pretty groovy. And after two songs, George turned and said, will you stop doing that? Why are you shaking your head? Are you telling, are you telling everyone that you, we shouldn't be signing? I said, no, I'm just moving my head because I just think you're pretty good. <laughs> We put out two singles, the names of which escape me right now, which weren't hits, and George was getting a bit desperate. And then he wrote the song which we'd never um, heard at this point. It wasn't the song we signed the one called Do You Really Want to Hurt Me? And as soon as we heard that song, we all went, this is your first big hit. And I remember absolutely clearly where I was being with Simon, coming back from lunch and meeting George on the corner of Portobello Road, just bumping into me, he was coming out of the office, we were coming back in. And we'd all just said, do you really want to hurt me? It's got to be your next single. George said, ah, it's not, you know, this, this conversation took place on the street. I don't want it to be a single. It's too slow if I go on television and told the pops I won't be able to dance to it properly. And I remember him saying, over my dead body will this be our next single. <laughs> well, it was, and he's still alive, so. I'll tell you the, th the three artists that, that I remember working with all roughly at the same time not quite, but at Virgin, who I thought were people that really inhabited a different planet than me, were Captain Beefheart, Scott Walker, and a wonderful, wonderful Canadian singer called Mary Margaret O'Hara, who's made one of the great records, the only record she's ever made, called Miss America. It's, those who know it love it. And, and each, having conversations with each, each of them was a pretty surreal experience. Beefheart would, would spin you out on this surrealistic sort of word trip and he was so mesmeric and charismatic but he was playing games with you because because just when you thought when he thought that you actually were losing what he'd said he'd ask you a question about whether you were paying attention earlier on so he was really he would definitely play those kind of scott walker was a lovely guy but quite a troubled individual i think i suspect um and would come up with the most extraordinary excuses as to why he would postpone the start of making this record. You know, it would all be to do with the alignment of the stars and, and the times of the, you know, whether the, it was the lambing season or the, whether the leaves had turned certain shades of colour. And Mary, I suppose my favourite story about Mary Margaret O'Hara, having made a, very, very laboriously and with extreme difficulty made this first record. So. We started making the second record, and then she kind of panicked halfway through making the second record. She had a real phobia about recording. I think it was a bit like, you know, how some um, remote tribes have a fear of having their photograph taken because it captures their soul. I think she felt like that about committing her music to permanence on tape. She felt it killed the soul of the song or something. So she kind of decided she couldn't go through with this recording process, and we still got the tapes of this half-finished record. And I thought, but she had no problem with going and touring live, playing in front of people. Um, so I said, okay, let's do this in a way that's going to make it easy for you. Let's just record live, just do a succession of live concerts, or, or let's record, just find a room that you like, just playing with your band, or set up a little, so it doesn't look like a studio, a little kind of remote recording facility, whatever. And I said, so look, what, what, where do you think, where should we record this record? And she said, how about recording it in my head? Didn't really have an answer to that. And then she actually said to me, I don't really need to make this record because I know what it sounds like. 